So, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, you will notice there is a um, change in the title. The title was very general, and I couldn't do everything that I meant to do under that title, so I've focused it a little. Um, basically, I'm going to be focusing on, on the recent, um, during the crisis, reform of the um, um, vocational education and training in Spain, which was dual VET. And um, this uh, was part of a um, of, um, research carried out under the STYLE project, a European Commission funded project, now finished. <coughs> but we're still uh, carrying on with um, some of this research. This is one case of that. And uh, since it's an opportunity to get all the researchers uh, involved in one's project, this is one possible avenue of research. Uh, we're also working on in-work benefits, uh, working poor. Um, very recently, we've started another project looking at um, um, occupational welfare. So uh, if anybody is interested, uh, please talk to me after that. Um, oh, I forgot to put the names of my colleagues, but um, a bunch of people from the Department of Sociology and Applied Economics of the University of Oviedo, and mostly Aroa Tejero. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do, in essence, is to give you a fully brief overview of uh, the reasons for the reform, the main reforms, and then I'm going to try to focus briefly on aspects of policy transfer and policy learning and conclude with some recommendations as to how, you know, an important issue within CRIMT, how to um, consolidate um, what would be successful experiments, whatever I have time to do. Okay. So to give you a bit of context, um, I suppose uh, you've heard about um, the crisis hitting Spain quite badly. Uh, it overall, hit the, the youth um, employment market um, quite seriously in Europe, but Spain was a, a salient case. Spain traditionally has had a high level of youth unemployment, um, partly because of the dualism of its labor market by age, but also because of being a familist welfare state. Um, in which you know the, the employment of the parents has always been considered more important than that of the youth. They'll get there eventually, um, even by the unions. Um, this, this is what has always been the case. But this this got to a very worrying point in 2013. There was a historically <coughs> high uh, level of of unemployment among the youth of 55.5%. So something had to be done. Um, this was not the only problem of uh, youth in Spain. Um, also, we have a, tra a tradition of skills polarization. We have a lot of um, university graduates, which is a good thing. But we also have a lot of people with very low levels of, of skills, um, with only um, compulsory education or less, 34.5%. So the proportion of, of people with mid-level skills is very low, around 11%. <coughs> and that creates also a problem for employers. That is a serious mismatch of supply and demand of labor there. So um, among other policies, uh, the reform of uh, vocational education and training became um, urgent. Okay. Um, I want to stop with this. So very quickly, um, one well-known, at least in Spain, um, well-known problem of, of VET uh, is that um, it hasn't generally been attractive for students or their families. Uh, it doesn't have a great reputation, in essence. Um, only by the students go there, so parents prefer their uh, sons and daughters to go to university, um, that sort of thing. Also, it, does, it didn't have a great reputation among firms themselves. Uh, but also firms have generally had a very low commitment with providing training um, within the system. Um, it's not the only problem, but well, because of time, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. So um, in the midst of the crisis, uh, Spain started coming out of the crisis in 2016, to give you some context, so a lot later than other European countries. Um, there were all these reforms uh, in 2012, 13, 15, 17, that I'm very briefly going to, to sum up. 
Um, what is the interest of the Spanish case in this regard? Um, well, basically, I don't know anything about the Canadian system, so I cannot <coughs> put it in context there, but it's, um, it's very similar to, to the French one. It's an education-based system, and it shares some commonalities with the French system, like the tradition of workshop schools and some other things. It also has in, uh, another thing in common with Italy, which is there is a long-standing tradition of uh, training contracts also. And um, so that's where it's coming from. And what these reforms try to do is actually um, graft in the system some elements of the German um, dual VET, um, which um, I'll, I'll try to show. So I'm going to try to do that and also uh, focusing on learning and transfer processes. So I know this is very daunting. <laughs> Don't try to read it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the first reform, when it is introduced, um, it establishes two types, okay? And they are separate, they are independent, and they don't talk to each other initially. The next reform will try to do something about that. So there is a part that is within the education system, and there is another part which is within the employment system. The part within the education system, basically what is new is that they, they increase the amount of hours that um, students must be at the workplace while studying. But also, and this is very, very important, um, it increases the role of firms radically in, in the education system. Uh, firms now can, uh, on, on their own, initiate uh, design curricula. They couldn't before. Basically, they, they depended on the education system provision, right? Uh, now they can um, do their own curricula, decide where it is going to be um, given to the students. So it's um, a whole new world of participation for firms within the education system, which also has created problems. But um, this, as you may imagine, um, has, lead, has led to a lot of experimentation. Also, um, the system has been decentralized because regional governments, um, subnational level, uh, can also um, be agents uh, initiating changing in this area. Within the employment system, I'm not going to go in this part very much, I just have to mention it. Um, in this tradition of training contracts, they introduced a new um, training and apprenticeship labor contract, uh, which basically is heavily subsidized in terms of social security, 100% social re uh, security reductions, both on employer social security and worker social security. And they get, um, the firms get even more incentives if they convert the contract into an open-ended contract at the end of it, okay? So the immediate impact of um, this law was, well, these contracts increased um, very sharply, as you can see here from 2012. <coughs> what happened in 2015, I'll tell you now. Um, so two further reforms. In 2013, something else is introduced to make those two systems talk to each other. So basically, you could get a certificate uh, doing a, a course for the unemployed with um, a job placement, but that wasn't recognized by the educational system. So now those um, are to talk to each other, and the certificates from one system will be recognized by the other, which is um, the main change of, in 2013. In 2015, and this explains the massive drop <laughs> Um, in the uptake of these contracts by firms, what happened was that, well, trade unions have been traditionally very suspicious about what was the training component of these contracts and whether they were just labor, um, not earning very much, just minimum wage, and um, uh, substituting for more expensive labor in a world. So, um, new uh, higher requirements for transparency as to the training required um, provided by firms were put in place and um, it's quite funny but suddenly the use of this contract went down a lot. Um, the other Im very important change introduced in 2015 is that um, it radically changed the governance of the system in terms of social actors, I mean trade unions and employers participation in the system. They basically uh, since 2001 were overseeing and managing the system, the training for the unemployed. And they determined the use of funds, they determined the contents of the training for the unemployed. Um, and um, 
basically all that is removed from the from them and it will be again in 2017 made more explicit um not a lot of time but this was a link to some scandals i don't know if they got here as to the use of training funds in some parts of spain unions were involved um but um well it, okay it reverses the um, the trend i'll go back to that at the end so i use a very um simple uh, conceptual framework to to analyze policy transfer learning um basically policy transfer refers to um using um, policies from another system, uh, but it can be policy lending, which basically is uh, imposed, and there's been some of this in European policy, as you know, particularly in the case of Greece, uh, but also in Spain, to some extent, with the youth guarantee, I won't go there, or they can be voluntarily um, put in place, and in that case, we can talk of policy borrowing. Policy learning, um, again, can be defined in many ways. Uh, I'm, I'm using a very simple concept that is derived from available uh, evidence and experience, okay? And also, I'm looking at peer learning, which is basically learning from uh, other experts in the area, from other countries, uh, or from other reg regions, and we find some quite a lot of evidence of peer learning. Um, basically, from Germany, there's been policy transfer, by crafting some elements of the system, basically more hours at the workplace, and fostering firms' commitment with the system, which um, was not there previously. The main, vehicle, the main vehicle of policy transfer has been a cross-country peer learning among employers, among Spanish employers and German employers. German employers have been very active in fostering the reform of VET in Spain. Uh, key actors have been the European Alliance for Learning, the German government and the German chambers of governments via the Alliance for Dual VET in Spain, the Bertelsmann Foundation, and also, obviously, the Spanish Employers Federation and the Spanish Chambers of Commerce. So the, the employers were very much behind this reform, and it explains why so much leverage is given to, to firms. Um, in, in general, although Spain has an ideal um, context in which the, we should see a lot of peer learning within the country because it has a centralized structure but also the centralized self-government in the regions structures and they, technically they have meetings over employment policy and so on, uh, so they should talk to each other. We actually don't see that much peer learning between the regional governments in Spain. Basically, they are competing with each other. They're trying to look the best because it will affect the, the funds, but also because of political reasons. Who, you know, different parties in different regions and uh, in matters it might affect national politics. So, so we actually see more peer learning um, <coughs> within trade unions and within employers. Uh, associations than between regional governments. So it's interesting that they have been removed from this governance structure when actually they're possibly the best informed ones. How, how am I doing? Two minutes. Okay. Um, so um, policy learning and uh, experimentation. Um, experimentation galore in, in Spain on this. Um, as I mentioned, the reform lets each region do their own thing, and that's what's happened. Uh, some have experimented less, ha some are experimenting every year. Like uh, the past country, just for our system is good, we're just going to add one thing, which is uh, we are allowed now to put an extra year, um, so we'll do that. Uh, Madrid changes the programs every year, and it's not very clear that it's evidence-based, for instance. Uh, Asturias is an example, we can talk more about it in, in the questions if you are interested in it, is an, is an example of uh, a pure experiment uh, pilot project, a result of tripartite uh, social consultation and uh, from scratch. They did something that hadn't been done, hasn't been done, and they combined both um, the employment system and the training system. I don't have time to go into it. but. They show evidence of policy learning. Uh, it's still going on. They're learning from it. They're going to do changes. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the disappearance of um, social actors in, in this because uh, I don't know if it is um, <laughs> policy learning or policy unlearning. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, 
basically from 2001, the idea was, which is ingrained in the German system too, to incorporate these uh, social actors, they are the ones that know what the skills are needed um, in each sector, and suddenly we, we forget about that, we remove them. Um, they're going to be there, but just looking. Basically, there'll be a committees, but they will not have any capacity to design. Um, and this was reinforced in 2017. Employers are particularly mad about this development because they put the, um, how do you say, the lion's share uh, of the money by uh, firm social security contributions. And, um, but nothing is changing there so far. Even with the change of government, I've not heard anything. I don't know if Miguel has heard something. Uh, so finally, and I'm done. Some uh, on view of um, experiments such as the Asturian one, some basic things that might help consolidate what are successful experimentations. Um, my idea is creating a framework of both funding and governance that uh, incentive, uh, puts incentives on um, different agencies talking to each other, especially education and employment. Um, because current epistemic knowledge communities are being downplayed in all this process. So it's, it's a bit the Wild West, um, everybody doing their own thing. Also, uh, I would say we have to put, uh, um, again, value on actors' knowledge and all that um, peer learning orientation they have, increase um, the analysis of uh, impact um, data, and emphasize employers' resp social responsibility in preventing social exclusion in the long term, rather than the failures of the education system in providing uh, the right education in that moment that employers need. Thank you.